morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Ryan Blamley with My Two Cents podcast. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to Friska Viria. Uh, Friska is uh, our change lead at DNA. Uh, Friska and I worked together already for now about a year. And we have been working in a similar space, but however, also a bit of a different space around digital transformation and helping organizations uh, find their new niches in times of change. Today, mm -hmm. we actually want to talk about uh, one of the key elements within transformation and change, and that's not implementing a digital solution. It's not about uh, uh, getting a, a project plan out, out there where we have a timeline of uh, X number of months and we deliver something into markets. We mm -hmm. really want to talk about achieving a cultural innovation. How do you transform your organization? Well, if you look at organizations who are in, in a startup, generally they are they don't have a lot of processes. They just get on with it. They have an idea concept. They have a dream. And that dream, based on that dream, they're hiring people to achieve that dream. At a certain level, they get to the point that they have to change. They have to professionalize. They have to scale up and they have to embed processes. Now, on the other hand, you have organizations who are here for 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years, maybe even longer. And to survive in these times, we need to keep innovating. And that's just not just a technical. So today we want to try to answer the question, how do you achieve innovation and transformation by enabling your organization to have and embed a culture of uh, innovation? So as I mentioned, Friska is joining me today, and I'm really glad that uh, Friska is joining me today on this topic, because this is really a topic uh, which goes uh, into her heart. It's, it's really a, a topic for her. Uh, Friska, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I've been in change and transformation for the better part of a decade now. I've led change projects impacting up to 23,000 people across six of the seven continents for some of the biggest names in mining, engineering, technology, and higher ed. And through my years leading change in all shapes and sizes all around the world, I found it's not, it's not the tool, it's not just the behavior, but like you said, you need to have the mindset and the culture that accompanies it. Because if you don't, then any behavior change that you do drive will be very short lived. You know, you'll return three months later and they would have reverted back to the old way of doing things. And this is hard because, hey, culture change is hard. Um, it's intangible. Um, and that's why a lot of companies give up after three, four, five months in, right? Um, and we'll talk about this later when we, when we dive deep into the question, but I believe that a big source of why most culture change fails is because the entire system is not conducive to, to such a long-term change. People are obsessed with their quarterly earnings, are obsessed with keeping expenses down, you know, profits up, but change, like anything worthwhile in life, it takes commitment, it takes resources, it takes persistence and perseverance. So. Great stuff, great stuff. Yeah, we, we both know that. We both have been in a lot of transformations. Uh, um, I, I remember from uh, a few years ago, I was doing a transformation where we were predominantly focused on harmonizing uh, multiple systems into a, a basically a common group system. And mm. we had a few challenges uh, besides the, the integration of the systems and capturing the requirements versus uh, capturing the experience. That's something I want to talk about also later in this uh, podcast. Um, but also the challenge we have was the culture across those different markets and how to get towards a seamless way of merging those, those, those different cultures into a one culture across those markets plus the innovative thinking. What experience do we want to deliver as an organization? Now, what, what will be the key challenges you see uh, in, in, in practice when uh, organizations are trying to implement a culture of innovation? Uh, what you just said then, like different, especially if it's a global company, different countries, different offices will have their own version of what innovation means to them. So often there's not enough effort paid to like, paid attention to what does company-wide innovation look like? What does good look like? And if they were serious about building a culture of innovation, innovation is predicated on trust. And at the end of the day, 79% of companies report that uh, employees have low trust in them. And this is really sad. So 
if you want to innovate, you have to start building this. And so employees must trust that it's okay to fail. And how do you build trust? Well, it's only enabled when they see what leaders say, do, and most importantly, what they reinforce are aligned, right? Words are important, but your actions speak louder. For example, you know, innovation traditionally has a high failure rate. I mean, that is the whole point. It's to try things and that maybe out of five things, one will work really well, but that one will make all the other five worth it. So that means when employees try something new and it doesn't work out, you don't sort of wrap them on the knuckles. They still need to be rewarded for making the attempt at innovation, not just when it works. It's something so simple, but many companies miss. Yeah, no, I, I agree fully. I agree fully. I think also that the, the role of the leader is going to be really important in that space. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we had a discussion uh, actually recently with another client and they said to me, look, we have a change agent within the organization and a change agent is responsible for achieving this transformation for making sure that we as organization move forward. And I actually say I don't agree because at the end of the day, the change agent is there to, um, to facilitate you leaders, to facilitate the organization in anything they need to achieve that, that, that different mindset, that culture, that, that, that change yeah. in, 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 in doing. Um, but ultimately it should be the leader mm. who's taking ownership. Do you feel that leaders are educated uh, and are, owning that space enough within organizations uh no and this is and i really think that one um a person that's not open to change that's not adaptable that can poison the lake for a thousand others um at the end of the day unfortunately we still don't have enough diversity around the boardroom table um or the executive table and that's why you don't get enough change you don't get enough calculated risk taking because most people hire for capability, not character. You know, when, when we're looking for executives, we should uh, look for things, you know, what, what do normal job descriptions have? Oh, uh, master's degree, Ivy League education, most technically capable person in the room. But things that describe innovation, they're not capability, they're actually character driven, right? Risk-taking, adaptability, um, openness to change, but how often are those sort of traits prioritized over uh, more hard skills, more technical skills. That's a good, that's actually a really good one. Uh, it's the, mm -hmm. the um, what we always see here, uh, people who are really good in sales, they get promoted to sales leader. And mm -hmm. then they find out that the role of the sales leader is not actually doing sales, but managing the finances, which often is the feeling a lot of sales leaders have. Um, yeah. That capability, that risk taking across the whole business. What can organizations do to enable their 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 leadership team, uh, or actually on the hiring process, process already, start thinking mm -hmm. about what do we need for the future? And I got a feeling that when I look at hiring processes, uh, also the experience I have personally in in, in working with HR business partners, which um, I often do not really see as business partners, but they do actually mm -hmm. what we tell them to do. How can we change the way we hire people to make sure that we are hiring for the future? Mm. I think your... we need to. I think we need to look at what are the critical skills that are needed in the future. Um, and I think people overestimate the importance that industry experience or even years of experience has, uh, because at the end of the day, what we learn today in five years' time, it will be irrelevant. Like look at the higher educational institutions all around the world. They are getting disrupted in a major way. You know, the rise of um, massive open online courses, platforms such as, you know, LinkedIn Learning, Udemy, Teachable. These are all slowly but surely eating away that market. And the same rings true for how we hire. I mean, just look around the, your boardroom table. You don't have a circle of change. You have a cage of complacency often because the people that are there, they got to where they are today because of what they've done in the past. And so they have no incentive to change and they don't realize that to get to where they want to be tomorrow, to get to where the company needs to be tomorrow, requires a totally different toolkit, a different leadership style, and often a different person altogether. And so what I found is that a lot of change projects that should have been successful, but got killed, it's because the wrong person was leader, was the wrong leader, the wrong sponsor, 
was nominated uh, to see it through. Cool. So um, we're talking about the wrong leader, wrong person. Let's 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 just jump a little bit more on on uh, the leadership style. We what are the types of leadership styles we could put forward, which are great ones if you want to work towards more innovation. Um, mm. As we all know, there are, there are about ten or twelve main leadership styles from being uh, more in control that real manager or the empathic manager if yeah. you look at the core leadership styles and uh, typologies we would mm. prefer to have when we are looking towards a more innovative innovative mindset and thinking towards the future what would they yep. be so the leaders who have been effective sponsors of significant transformation wide change they exude empathy authenticity curiosity right curiosity over contempt vulnerability the openness to say i don't know or yes i got it wrong and resilience and what i've found is that they have not just the iq which is obvious but they have really strong eq and aq as well so they can manage not just their emotions but the emotions of others in the room and they're obviously adaptable they're not wedded or tethered to a particular tool mindset or view that they are very open to um, accepting information from others and then and then changing a course of tact. Whereas a lot of leaders are very stuck in their way of doing things and not open to other people's viewpoints. So their adaptability quotient re will really determine how successful the organization is over time. Right? Yeah, it brings me down to the next step actually, because um, if we want to drive a culture of innovation, we also have to measure the performance of the organization in a totally different way. We traditionally measure on revenue, on uh, on the number yep. of cases, the MPS, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. But those are not the elements which drive a culture of innovation. What yep. elements could we add uh, towards our uh, KPI-driven organizations which will drive that innovation, which will measure if you are mm. on track or not? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, when I was consulting to uh, the world's single largest police jurisdiction, they were starting to drive a culture of innovation as well. Hmm. So what they rewarded, uh, they had some an innovation platform where people could submit ideas. They rewarded what they measured were how many ideas on the platform, how many new ideas submitted, how many recurring um, users that submitted multiple ideas, how many were green lighted to a proof of concept, how many developed to a prototype, how many to an MVP? So yeah, there, there's a whole raft of new measures um, that are applied to innovation. So profit and loss is not going to cut it. I agree. I agree. But I, I'll, I want to take it a bit further because now we're talking about uh, MVPs, more the digital part of, of innovation. Um, there's also a culture, the, the cultural part of innovation, because I think it's all about mm -hmm. mindset. And uh, of course, it's great to have more ideas and thinking in abundance. Uh, in a few weeks' time, we're going to talk to uh, one of our other associates, Paco, uh, who is really into uh, innovation, but from an abundance thinking. Uh, mm. So we'll touch the topic more in in that space. If we now look at culture of innovation, and uh, we talk about MVPs and that kind of stuff, we generally talk about product management teams, marketing teams, who are driving mm. the innovation, the customer into innovation towards clients. Now, that's fine. That's good because that's where you basically innovate towards your product strategy. But the culture of innovation means it has to be carried on all levels. That customer service mm -hmm. agent needs to be innovative in finding modern and creative ways of solving uh, solving things they yeah. are they're 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 getting in front of them. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? How do we make sure that not only the product team is talking about innovation, the marketing team is marketing the innovation, the sales guy doesn't have a clue what's behind it and can communicate that to their clients. And the service mm -hmm. person is there just to fix the problems they always have. Mm -hmm. If you want to drive a culture of innovation, I, from my perspective, it has to be on all levels. Innovation has to be everybody's job. If you say it's a culture, then everybody's part of the culture, not just the marketing team. So I think for a very conservative company to say, oh, we want to build a culture of innovation is very scary. So instead of this massive tidal wave of culture change, which many people find daunting, instead just build openness to doing something different, just one project at a time. 
you know, talk to the different um, customer groups uh, and functions. Start small, right? Find one person willing to give it a go. Resource it, pilot, test, learn, apply. And the challenge is getting that first one because no one wants to be first. So find a willing subject, um, execute, promote to the best of your ability, and then use that as a case study. Use the small wins to influence others to try something new. So people rely on social proof to make decisions. And so this way you reduce the failure um, of trying something new while increasing the reputation to deliver. And if you're serious about building a culture of innovation, it needs to be resourced sufficiently. Like it doesn't come for free. People need to be freed up from their regular day jobs to even have the mental space to think about doing something differently, right? So if you don't create the conditions for change, you can't expect, you know, your culture to suddenly be innovative. Mm -hmm. So the next question, Paul. Um, I had last time I had a chat with uh, with with a, a guy who was responsible for customer experience transformation. Uh, he was more on the ego side, and he said at a certain point, Raheem, I need the leaders to step up. They're just not stepping up. How? Where do I start? Because I have a really digital mindset, uh, which is more related to the tooling you use and the way you approach your your actions. Mm -hmm. um, but where do I start? Because I, how do I convince a leader or how do I help him transform to actually drive that culture of innovation within his team? Mm. See, often leaders don't know what, what, what the hell does that mean? What does step up mean? Does it mean talk at a town hall? Does it mean send an email? Like it's to get the behavior change that you want, you need to provide very easy to understand red light, green light. This is good. This is bad. Right, so people know what's expected of them. And I dare say your friend hasn't communicated that uh, very, very well. Like, and people need to be given metrics. Like, does it mean attend every single stand-up meeting? Does it mean, like, what does that mean? You know, you, you really need to define what stand-up means for them. And no one was born with the know-how on how to be a leader that promotes innovation. So like anything, they need to be taught. They need to be given the resources. Right? They need to be acknowledged for their role in the part in driving innovation. And they're not taught this in business schools, right? Unless you've got a special leading change course in your organization, people don't know what they don't know. So give them the information, give them the resources, and then encourage them to step up into their role. And like any good change person, I would collect data and visualize their success. So any positive feedback that they get from this, you know, with this new behavior change that they've done, you want to consistently feed that back to the leader that's doing that. And, and this whets their appetite to do even more. That's a great point. The, da the data part mm -hmm. is really important and uh, gets back actually to an earlier question around the KPIs. We, we tend to have all those, those, those high level KPIs, organization, uh, uh, KPIs like revenue and 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 and, and net profit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The difficulty, I, I, I guess, and I, I, I also experienced in the past, is just how do we really measure that um, we are driving that in that culture? What are the elements we should really measure along the way? And those are not the harder KPIs, but there are also a lot of soft KPIs which we can measure. Mm. Think about employee surveys. How how could an organization get get through that? build up the capability so during the year they start building that pipeline of information um, on where they can coach and help their teams to move forward because on one end we can tell mm -hmm. them okay fine you need kpis which are more on the eq or aq fine but what what does that yep. mean for an organization yeah uh, i think you hit a good point like people shouldn't be obsessed with numbers and metrics for example um a kpi that i usually use for organizational culture change is how new joiners of the company describe it, say, after the first four weeks. And if innovation isn't one of those words, then you want to, be, you want to, you want to know why. You want to ask them, right? Because this is fresh blood, fresh eyes. Four weeks in, you, know, you give them a survey. How would you describe the company in, in X number of words? And then you know it's not hitting the mark yet. And then you probably need to revisit your induction processes so what, what is the new joiner exposed to when they first are indoctrinated into your company? And if they're not exposed to innovative practices, terminology, then it makes sense that they don't think it's 
it's innovative. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a great word. Uh, tapping a bit back in. So we were talking about one KPI, the data, uh, uh, the role of the leader uh, in any transformation. One thing you mentioned uh, is around the communication. And I really like the communication part. Uh, and generally, mm -hmm. you have your monthly town hall. Uh, maybe now during the COVID, they have a quarterly town hall if they're lucky. Um, they have their weekly stand up meetings with their leaders, etc. From experience, you will have the same experience when, when doing your transformations. It's quite difficult to make sure that 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 discussion around the experience you want to deliver throughout your transformation of your organization. And if that's innovation or another kind of transformation you want to deliver, that that needs to mm -hmm. be done on all levels of the organization and yes. in a structural way of doing it. A lot yes. of organizations fail in doing that. We talk about the town hall and everybody gets mm -hmm. up. Uh, now we do it through Zoom. It's so no boring. Way. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> 15 minutes alone, I'm gonna, gonna have a nap. <laughs> but this is, this is the challenge. This is the challenge, Rahim. This is why change communication is so important. And this is why the failure rate for change management projects has not changed for the past two decades. It is very frustrating because um, often uh, communication is handled by someone else. It's handled by the marketing person. Like unless the change management consultant is A, really good, is B, trusted and handed over the reins, often they don't have enough influence over what gets said. And no disrespect, but often the communications person is very corporate and takes out all the emotive language that I've so painstakingly put to encourage, you know, the desire to do something different, to encourage interest in innovation, it usually gets stripped out. So there's there's turf wars and the communication is not is ineffective because it's not done often enough. The language is devoid of any emotion and is usually very corporate. They don't vary their communication channels, platforms, or formats. And so it's kind of, people are bombarded with information, right? And if it looks same, same as any other annual report, then guess what? Delete, right? And, and how, how comfortable are leaders doing what you and I do right now? We're just having a chat, having a dialogue, fireside chat. God forbid they turn their videos on. It's very rare. You know, it's like you really need to take your corporate masks on and show your vulnerability. If you're asking your own people to do something different, you know, have a go and that you don't want them to fear doing that, then you need I, to do it. I always say in those, those cases, guys, when was the last time you celebrated failure? Yeah. And this is always, always yeah. a nice question. And if I look at myself personally, I love to fail. If I didn't fail mm. once a day, twice or three times a day, I haven't learned anything. I haven't progressed. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. are on the new adventure with DNA. And for a lot yeah. of people who are listening, uh, you've seen that in the last few months, we have been uh, transforming DNA more in the remote mentoring because we want to do something really good for organizations. We are opening yeah. up the space we're working in. We're sharing information. But that's a difficult thing because you're changing your whole dynamic from being a consultant to being a person online, yes. engaging with people, yep. uh, finding new innovations in how we how we explore what we are doing. We are yep. failing every single day. Uh, yeah, I if, it, if it was with... easy, everybody would do it. Exactly. <laughs> no, so, that's true. So, that's true. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a good point. We should start fuck up Fridays. That's it. A new holiday. Fuck up Fridays. I love them. Fuck up Fridays. <laughs> fuck up Fridays. <laughs> This is a great one. Fuck off Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> so for people in the UK, uh, uh, if you hear us saying fuck off, you can do your own beep. Uh, I'm not beeping this. Uh, this <laughs> <but I'll... laughs> it's a joke, by the way. <laughs> fuck off Fridays. Yeah, I, I, th I think we're going to make a new product. I think that we are, we're ready yeah. to, to launch a new product, the fuck off Fridays. We can start a movement, yeah. <laughs> Love it, love it, love it. <laughs> hey, a bit back to the to transformation because uh, uh, we've been yeah. talking about KPIs, data, uh, uh, leadership, uh, a little bit around the, the people of the organization. Mm. Now, uh, I've been working for a lot of corporate organizations and uh, we ha always have been driven by uh, investor a value with equity value in, in, in all those mm. roles behind it. Um, the challenge within uh, 
getting the values within the organization versus what you mm -hmm. have your values towards your investors. Uh, there, there's a fine line. When you present it back, and I always have to laugh about it, when we have the corporate presentation with all the numbers, etc. again, you're right, they're boring, but people want to know, that's fine. Then you have the second level is, is what is your internal, what's the internal vibe you want to create around transformation? Uh, I'm a strong believer, you know that, I'm a strong believer in corporate entrepreneurship. Mm. When I was leading people, I would never tell them how to fix a problem. I would ask them, how can we do it better? What will you do to achieve that? And I would let them fail mm -hmm. and not fail uh, on purposely, but I'll give them the option, guys. It doesn't matter if you do it wrong, as long yeah. as we progress. This is something difficult for a lot of um, manager type of leaders, because I think you have managers, people who are there to manage KPIs. You often see them in the factory. You have a whole line, you're building a car mm -hmm. and every step has to be done within two or three minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. Soon we have a chat with uh, Tiago who's a really lean management in the manufacturing. He can tell you everything about those KPIs. But uh, effectively, if you uh, look at an organization, you have different types of communication, which if you mix them, they, it could be illogical because your story towards your business needs to be the same. So how do you build your corporate story? And how do you build a funny, fun to do transformation innovation story which still stays in sync. What would be the elements you would be using? Mm, I think you need to get your key messages aligned. So, like, for example, explaining what I do. I have different versions. I have a simple version, a formal version. Like, I, I imagine myself, how would I explain this to a seven-year-old? How would I explain this to a 17-year-old? How would I explain this to a 70-year-old? So the same logic applies when it comes to getting people to resonate with your vision for change because what works for one person is not going to work for another, but you need to have some common elements to it, right? Like, like your objectives, what good looks like and why. That why is very important. That needs to be the same regardless of whether you're talking to your investors, your employees, your partners, your suppliers, whoever. The driving force needs to be consistent. That exactly. needs to be the anchor. And then it's just a matter of repackaging it in different language, in a different format to suit the audience. I, I love this part because it's all about tailoring the message. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you popped this one up because uh, in generally we try to do one message. We don't, we are scared of giving a different message. But at the end of the day, everyone listens to a message the way they want to hear that message. Yes. And that's yes. also an important thing, I think, for, for, for leaders to, to, to take into account. Uh, I made that mistake in the past, too. I had one single message within my team. And I had a good learning, actually. Uh, this is a real-life story. I had a team which consisted out of a lot of different competences, a lot of different mm -hmm. focus areas, from development teams to service teams to uh, success managers. Uh, there was a bit of sales in there. I did a bit of re-engineering in certain markets and certain programs. Uh, so I had a, a, a lot of hats to wear, but mm. ultimately the message was we wanted to elevate the clients at the customer experience. So mm. all our targets will be set on customer experience. Um, one mistake I made uh, over time is that I forgot that the IT team was, they were interested of course in the customer experience, but the dynamics they were working in were so different that mm. the story didn't resonate with them. We yeah. had the same goal, the same mission, vision, one team, one yeah. mission, one vision. That was the idea. But effectively, by being part of so many different teams, and I was lucky actually, mm -hmm. because I had that learning. Most leaders mm -hmm. are, I'm leader of a sales team. I'm leader of a service mm -hmm. team. It's one thing. But what I learned is that overarching all those different functions within the organization, the messaging should have been different, although the why statement is the same. I agree fully with you. The, mm. the, the, the effective communication on how we would get there and what we should do was different. A lot of people don't have that, how do you call it? If you, if you, if you throw a ball at me, I would come up with 20 ideas. That's me. If I throw a ball at someone else, they may run It'll away. hit them in the head. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Could be painful, actually. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, here comes another fuck up Friday. <laughs> but effectively, the, the message you tell your organization and your people could be different because the perspectives are different. Uh, if, you, if you look at your experience, uh, I know you did that uh, the program at the mining company, 30,000 people were impacted. Digital mm. in mining, I, always, I'm, I, I every time when I hear the story, I'm going, wow, digital mining, how does that work? You had that same challenge. Mm. How do you deliver those, those, those executives, those leaders, the right message, which yep. they are comfortable of telling their team members in those different mm. situations? Mm. Yeah, exactly. I had to make it, I couldn't, I had to talk in a language, you know? So the digital team was fighting for relevance and budget because communication wasn't their strong suit to get funding for digital initiatives, how it used to roll before I came on board, literally a laundry list, an Excel spreadsheet, just text, 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 text. So I threw that aside. And instead of that, I mapped the value, the digital initiatives to each step in the mining value chain. And a picture says a thousand words and they could see exactly at which point in the process was technology trying to optimize the way they did their business. And from then, they could see that it was really not, not the mining team and the digital team, but one team. So it's a matter of speaking in their language and a picture says a thousand words. Yeah. It's a bit like value stream mapping. Huh? I did a course a yeah. few years ago where I actually, and actually helped me. So if you guys are uh, listening and you're a change maker, I re really recommend you um, deep diving a bit in value stream mapping, uh, especially when you're looking at changing an organization and helping uh, bring the value into the organization. People will only really run for something if they believe that that's the right thing to do. And yeah. even if it's not something they would like to do, if the value is there, they're willing to jump on that journey. Uh, there's mm. always a will and there's always a way. Mm. But what mm. I learned from the value stream mapping, uh, and I applied it a lot, is that in every step of a transformation, depending on which team you touch, which part of the organization you touch, there's always a value for them. What you want to achieve ultimately is that if you have a, a sales transformation, it also impacts service. It also impacts the way you do service. It also impacts your operations. It also impacts all elements of the organization. Often mm. what you see in those transformation programs is that you have a sales program, you have a service program, you have an operations program, you have a data investment program, et cetera, et cetera. They're all seen, uh, seen as singular programs within an organization mm. where other teams think, okay, but that's not my responsibility. I'm not responsible yep. for service, I'm sales. Why should I get involved? Well, if service yeah. does a bad job, you're not selling, you're not renewing. Mm. So the principle of value stream mapping is, 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 is mapping the end-to-end -end process and how all those investments or disinvest investments line up towards achieving a certain goal, a group goal, mm. a company goal, a company vision, your why statement. And I really love that because it actually helped me drive a lot of transformations and create a co-creation co culture, mm. not a team mm. culture, not an individual yep. change, but an, a, a group transformation where everyone feels that if you turn on, uh, let's say the, uh, you turn the steering wheel of the Tesla, you know the Tesla will turn. Well, in a few years time, you'll have multiple Teslas dr driving in one line. If everyone turns to the wrong direction, that auto driving will not, will not help. We will crash. Yeah. So yeah. value stream mapping helps us map that whole process together. And you did the same thing, I think, also within the mining. I think that's also the example you were referring to just now mm. um, yep. uh, in, in how to do How it. the different initiatives overlay at each step of the process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. how it all fits together. Most importantly is how it all fits together. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Mm. Love it, love it. So we talked about data, we talked about leadership, we talked about culture, uh, we, we touched some, some tools. Um, looking out a bit at the time, uh, we're now about 27 minutes in. Oh, 27 minutes in. Um, let's wrap up for today. Uh, I think we have yep. covered a lot of cool stuff. If um, uh, people uh, uh, who are listening want to know more about you, uh, you're part of the DNA. Uh, you're one of our, uh, I call it, you're one of our biggest assets on the transformational part. 
if they want to learn more about you, how can they engage with you through DNA and, and what is your offering ultimately uh, through, uh, through the network? Yeah, so I add value through a number of different formats. <laughs> Just like how you have to communicate change in different formats. <laughs> yep, you have to find what resonates. So I walk the talk, people. So obviously I'm a consultant, but I'm also a coach, trainer and a mentor. So I have different topics. I run masterclasses, which range from 60 minutes to two and a half hours. So you get 10 years of my experience in 60 minutes. And the topics are introduction to change, uh, communication without influence, um, managing resistance and leading change. So there's a few different topics and you can reach out to me directly um, if you want something bespoke for you and your organization. And if they want more background info on me at all, my website's freshbyfriska.com. Cool. So guys, uh, Friska is also, of course, in the DNA web store. If you want to have more information about what Friska does or you want to uh, engage with her in certain areas, you can also always DM me. Uh, for the next sessions, we uh, we have a few people who are already scheduled to, to do some uh, uh, cool sessions. We're going to talk about uh, information like uh, what, is, what does it mean, especially now, to differentiate yourself as a sales organization in times of crisis? How do you actually are able to close deals in these complex times? Because the traditional way of working with now all the virtual stuff is, mm. is, is, is quite complex. So we have fronts uh, uh, mm. in the next few weeks uh, who is going to join us for a session to teach you guys more on, on value selling and differentiation, uh, a really cool topic. We will also have, uh, um, we will also talk about a different side of innovation because we're now talking about cultural in innovation, but we were talking about um, the innovation of being happy at work, the innovation of happiness at work. And I think that's also quite a cool topic. So I want to invite the people who are now listening to this podcast to DM me if there are, for instance, topics you would like to touch, topics around transformation, topics around digital, uh, topics around leadership development, or maybe you want to develop yourself, just DM me because I'm really keen to hear from you guys uh, what are great topics for us to talk about and maybe get you guys also on board on this podcast. Uh, to close off, thank you very much, Friska, for joining this session. I really loved it. Uh, funny as always, uh, the fuck up Fridays is now a hot topic on my list. So <laughs> this one we're going to put in. I think we should be uh, doing Friday uh, drinks, the fuck up Fridays. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I love I love the dynamic also of today, and it was really great talking to another change maker like myself. Uh, I learned a lot mm -hmm. from you, uh, and uh, yeah, let's continue uh, building up DNA uh, for the listeners. Again, uh, every week, every two weeks, we will be posting a new uh, podcast. If you want to engage with one of the associates, you want to get to know them a bit better, or know what we can offer, just DM me, and I will send you the information uh, um, as soon as possible. Uh, wish you guys a great day, evening, morning, night, wherever you are in the world. Uh, and thank you for listening. See you guys. Thank you.